Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, I am Dr. Kalpana Ramachandran, Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy, Sri Muthukumaran Medical College, Hospital and Research Institute, Chennai. Today's lecture will be on the gross anatomy of anal canal. Let us begin this lecture with a clinical case study. A 50 year old man complained that he frequently passed blood stain stools for the past one year without pain. Recently, he had noticed that his bowel protruded out of the anus at the time of defecation and this caused discomfort. The doctor examined the patient and came to a diagnosis. These are the questions for this clinical case study. What is the clinical condition the patient has got which bleeds during defecation? What is the anatomical basis of this condition? Why is the bleeding not painful? We will discuss the answers for these questions at the end of the lecture on anal canal. Before we go into the gross anatomy of anal canal, I would like to mention some of the applied anatomy of the anal canal. As you can see from the picture which is shown, first is a fissure in ano. Second is fistula in ano and the next clinical condition is hemorrhoids which can be internal hemorrhoid and external hemorrhoid. We will now discuss the gross anatomy of anal canal to understand the applied aspects of the anal canal. These applied anatomy will be discussed at the end of the lecture. So, anal canal is the terminal part of the large intestine. You can see from this picture, this is a sagittal section of male pelvis depicted above and below, large intestine and also the entire digestive tract. So, the anal canal is going to begin where the rectal ampulla is going to narrow down and continue as the anal canal. This is at the level of the U shaped sling formed by the puborectalis muscle. Anal canal is situated below the pelvic diaphragm. It is going to lie in the anal triangle of the perineum. What you are seeing here is a picture of perineum. There are two triangles in the perineum which is divided by an imaginary line joining the two ischial tuberosities. The anterior triangle what you are seeing here is a urogenital triangle and the posterior triangle is the anal triangle. So, you can see the anal opening in the anal triangle. So, anal canal is going to lie in the anal triangle between right and left ischioanal fossa. This ischioanal fossa allows expansion of the anal canal during passage of feces. Next is the extent and course of the anal canal. So, anal canal is going to begin at the anorectal junction marked here. This point is situated 2 to 3 centimeters in front on little below the tip of the coccyx. It runs downwards and backwards and it is going to open at the anal orifice. This anal orifice as you can see from the picture is situated 4 centimeters below and in front of the tip of the coccyx. Next coming to the peculiarities of the anal canal, the anterior wall is shorter than the posterior wall. One important peculiarity is that it is surrounded by sphincter ani muscles. There are internal and external sphincters which we will deal later. The tone of these sphincter muscles closes the anal canal and 
it opens only during defecation. So, what are the measurements of phenyl canal? The length as you can see from this picture, this is a picture to show the interior of the anal canal. It is about 3.8 centimeters long. The breadth when empty, the lateral walls are approximated so that the canal presents only an anteroposterior slit. Coming to the relations, you can observe the sagittal section of male pelvis and female pelvis. You can see from this picture that in male pelvis the bladder is in front close to the pubic symphysis and behind is the rectum and the anal canal and the posterior most structure is the sacrum and the coccyx. In case of female pelvis sagittal section you can see the pubic symphysis, urinary bladder, posterior to it is the uterus and the vagina and then posterior most structure will be your rectum which continues as the anal canal. Having understood this picture, let us understand the relations of anal canal. So, both in males and females, anteriorly there is a structure called perineal body, anterior to the anal canal is the perineal body. In case of males, also you have the spongy urethra as shown in this picture and also the bulb of the penis. In case of females, the anterior relation other than the perineal body is the lower end of vagina. Both in males and in females, posteriorly anal canal is related to the anocoxygeal ligament what you are seeing here and also the tip of the coccyx. These are the anterior and posterior relations of anal canal. Laterally, as I have already told, you have the ischio anal fossa and its contents. All around the anal canal is surrounded by sphincteric muscles, the tone of which is going to keep the anal canal closed. Now, let us look at the interior of anal canal. On looking at the interior of anal canal, you can see that it is divided into three parts. We divide that as upper area which is called as the mucus part, then a middle area which is the intermediate area or it is called as area of pecten or it is also called as a transition zone and a lower area which is called as cutaneous part. I will be describing in detail the three parts of the anal canal on an interior examination. So, if you look at the interior of anal canal, I have already mentioned the three parts. The measurements of these parts are the first upper part, mucus part is 15 millimeter long, middle area is about 15 millimeter long and the lower area is that is the cutaneous part is 8 millimeter long. So, now we will deal with each of these three areas in detail. First, we will look at the upper part which is the mucus part. As you can see from this picture, the upper area is 15 millimeter in extent and limited by a line which is called as pectinate line which is shown in yellow color in this picture. This is endodermal in origin. The area is going to be lined by mucous membrane and the mucous membrane lining epithelium is simple columnar epithelium. If you look at this mucous part in living, it will appear plum red because of the presence of venous plexus deep to the mucosa in the submucosa which is called as internal rectal venous plexus. So, the mucous membrane of the upper part shows some features. It shows some 6 to 10 longitudinal ridges which are called as anal columns. These are the anal columns of Morgagini. So, what are these anal columns of Morgagini? They are nothing but the reduplication of the mucous membrane, reduplication of the mucous membrane which contains terminal branches of superior rectal artery and vein. If you look at the lower end of these anal columns, they are united by means of a fold of mucous membrane which is transverse which is called as anal valves. 
So, you can see the picture these are the anal columns of Morgagni. The lower end are united by means of the anal valves. So, above each valve there is a depression in the mucosa this is called as anal sinus. The anal valves also show epithelial projections called anal papilla. Please remember these anal papilla are nothing but remnants of embryonic anal membrane. So, the anal valves together form a transverse line which runs all around the anal canal that is called as pectinate line or dentate line. You can see in the picture that the pectinate line is marked in yellow color. There is also another way of describing this pectinate line that is the inferior comb shaped. Can you see this? This is the inferior comb shaped limit of the anal valves form an irregular line that runs all around the canal that is called as pectinate line. This is situated opposite to the middle of the internal anal sphincter. This pectinate line is a very very important landmark because it indicates the junction between the superior part of the anal canal and inferior part of the anal canal. The superior part of the anal canal is derived from the embryonic hindgut. Please understand the superior part of the anal canal is derived from the embryonic hindgut that is it is endodermal in origin. The inferior part of the anal canal below the pectinate line is derived from the embryonic proctodium that is it is formed by ectodermal invagination. So, pectinate line is an important landmark. Other than the embryological origin there is an important aspect of the pectinate line which you should know that superior to the anal canal and inferior to the anal canal the arterial supply, the venous drainage, lymphatic drainage and the innervation are different. This is because of the different embryological origins of the superior and inferior parts of anal canal which I have already explained. Having read about the so upper part or the mucus part, we will now go on to the middle part which is the intermediate area. It is also called as area of pectin or it is called as transitional zone which is marked as a yellow box in this diagram. Again this part the middle part is 15 millimeter long like the upper part lined by mucous membrane. Please note the difference between upper part and the middle part. The middle part anal columns are absent. The lower limit of this middle part or the pectin has got a whitish appearance and it is referred to as white line of Hilton. The middle part is lined by stratified squamous epithelium, but there are no sweat and sebaceous glands in the epithelium. The epithelium here is thin, pale and glossy. The mucosa appears bluish pink in this area also because of dense venous plexus which lie between the mucosa and the muscle coat. So, the lower limit of the middle area is the white line of Hilton as seen from this picture. The intermediate area or the area of pectin has got a color contrast between the bluish pink area of mucosa in the pectin and the black skin below that is the lower cutaneous part. Now coming to the lower cutaneous part, this is only 8 millimeter long, this is ectodermal in origin, it is lined by true skin, it has got sweat glands, sebaceous glands and there are pigmentations. Some corrugation is also seen because of corrugator cutis ani 
Also you can see from this picture that there are coarse hairs which are present in the cutaneous part. So, it is lined by true skin with sweat and sebaceous glands. Having read about the three parts of the anal canal, we will just summarize what we have learned till now. We have learned that interior of anal canal shows three subdivisions, an upper area which is the mucus part, middle area which is the area of pectin which is again 15 millimeter long and lower area is the cutaneous part. Upper area there was presence of the anal column, lower end of the anal columns were joined by anal valves and a depression above the anal valve we called it as anal sinus. The anal valves together form a line, irregular line which was called as the pectinate line. This pectinate line is the lower limit of the upper part. This is lined by mucous membrane. Second was the middle area or the intermediate area or area of pectin which was lined by mucous membrane but did not have anal columns or anal valves. The last area we studied was the lower area of the anal canal which is the cutaneous part which was lined by the true skin with sweat and sebaceous glands and there were coarse hairs which were present. So, the pectinate line was the one which we described in detail, marked the junction between the embryonic hindgut and the lower part or the inferior part of the anal canal which was ectodermal in origin, developed from the embryonic proctodium that is the ectodermal invagination. Having read about the interior of anal canal, we will look at the musculature of anal canal. As already I have mentioned that anal canal is surrounded by sphincteric muscles. So, the anal sphincters are two, one is your internal anal sphincter what you are seeing here and outside is the external anal sphincter. External anal sphincter has got three parts. One is the subcutaneous part as shown in this picture, next is the superficial part and deepest is the deep part. So, there are two sphincters, one on the interior internal anal sphincter and on the exterior is external anal sphincter. Now, we will look, look at the sphincters in detail, first we will take the internal anal sphincter. As you can see from this picture that the wall of the gut tube has got muscle layer muscularis externa which has got an inner circular layer and a outer longitudinal layer. So, this internal anal sphincter is formed by the thickened circular muscle coat of this part of the gut. It is going to su surround the superior two thirds of the anal canal and extends from the anal canal upper end to the white line of Hilton. The contraction of this internal anal sphincter or the tonus is stimulated and maintained by sympathetic fibers which come from the hypogastric plexus. The contraction of this is inhibited by parasympathetic fibers which are going to come from pelvic splanchnic nerves. So, internal sphincters are stimulated by sympathetic fibers and inhibited by parasympathetic fibers. Coming to the external anal sphincter, external anal sphincter in contrast to internal sphincter is voluntary in nature. It is made up of striated muscles. As I have already told you internal sphincter is supplied by autonomic nervous system. The external sphincter is supplied by inferior rectal nerve and perineal branch of S4. As you can see from this picture that the external anal sphincter surrounds the entire length of the anal canal and is described to have three parts. So, the external sphincter is a large voluntary sphincter that forms a broad band 
that is going to surround the whole length of the anal canal. In contrast with the internal sphincter which surrounds only the superior two third of the anal canal and extends only till the white line of Hilton. So, this external anal sphincter as I already mentioned it has been described to have three parts namely subcutaneous, then a superficial and deep part. But actually these are only three zones, they are the zones rather than the muscle bellies and often they are indistinct, they are often indistinct. Their attachment is anteriorly they will be attached to the center point of the perineum that is the perineal body. This is a picture of the perineum, male perineum. So, the uh, sphincters are attached, external anal sphincters are attached anteriorly to the perineal body and posteriorly you can see that it is attached to the anocoxygel ligament and the coccyx. Superiorly it is going to blend with this muscle that is puborectalis muscle. Having learnt about internal sphincter and external sphincter of the anal canal, there is one more structure which is very very important which is called as anorectal ring because this is important in maintaining continence, anal continence. So, there is a distinct muscular ring formed at the junction of rectum with the anal canal. This is the area where your anorectal ring is present. This is formed by one is your internal sphincter, two is the deep part of the external sphincter and three is the puborectalis. I repeat the anorectal ring is at the junction of rectum and anal canal. It is a distinct muscular ring which can be felt by a finger in the anal canal. It is formed by internal anal sphincter, deep part of the external sphincter and puborectalis muscle. This anorectal ring helps in increasing the anorectal angle. So, if you divide this ring surgically, the patient will have rectal incontinence. Surgical division of the ring results in rectal incontinence. So, that is the importance of anorectal ring. Having studied the internal features of anal canal and the sphincters, let us now study the blood supply of anal canal. In that, first is the arterial supply of anal canal. As I have already mentioned, the arterial supply, venous drainage, lymphatic drainage and the innervation are different in the superior part of the superior part above the pectinate line and part below the pectinate line. So, we will be describing these things superior to pectinate line and inferior to pectinate line. So, superior to pectinate line the arterial supply is going to come from the superior rectal artery. Inferior to pectinate line and also to the surrounding muscles and perianal skin, there are going to be two inferior rectal arteries. You can see from this picture that the inferior rectal artery is coming from internal pudental arteries. Other than this, there is also a middle rectal artery which assists with the blood supply to anal canal by anastomosing with the superior rectal artery and inferior rectal arteries. The middle rectal arteries are going to come from the internal iliac arteries. So, there are three arteries supplying the anal canal, one is the superior rectal artery, middle rectal artery and inferior rectal artery. Coming to the venous drainage of anal canal, above the pectinate line, there are going to be venous plexus which are called as internal rectal venous plexus. You can see the picture in the right lower down corner that in the submucosa you have a plexus of veins which are called as internal rectal venous plexus. 
they are lying in the submucosa of the anal canal. So, they are going to drain into the superior rectal vein. This superior rectal vein itself is a tributary of inferior mesenteric vein and this is going to anastomose with the or communicate with the external rectal venous plexus. So, internal rectal plexus if you see it is in the form of series of dilated pouches. So, external rectal venous plexus if you see it is going to lie outside the muscle coat of the anal canal. So, lower part of this is going to be drained by means of the inferior rectal vein to the internal pudental vein. Middle part is going to be drained by the middle rectal vein which goes into the internal iliac vein. Upper part is going to be drained by the superior rectal vein which continues as the inferior mesenteric vein. The middle rectal vein forms anastomosis with the superior rectal vein and also with the inferior rectal vein. So, this middle rectal and inferior rectal vein are tributaries of cable system and your superior rectal vein which continues as inferior mesenteric vein is a tributary of portal system. So, in the anal canal you can see that there is portocaval anastomosis, portal component is by superior rectal vein and cable component is by the middle and inferior rectal vein. So, anal canal is an important site of portal and systemic veins that is the important site of portocaval anastomosis. Coming to the lymphatic drainage, superior to the pectinate line, lymphatic vessels drain into internal iliac nodes in relation to internal iliac artery. From there go into the common iliac node, they go into the common iliac nodes and also into lumbar node. Inferior to the pectinate line, the lymphatic drainage goes into superficial inguinal nodes. So, above pectinate line it is to the internal iliac node, common iliac nodes, lumbar nodes. Below pectinate line, lymphatic drainage is into the superficial inguinal nodes. Hence, pectinate line is an important anatomical landmark. Nerve supply also again will be describing superior to pectinate line and inferior to pectinate line. So, superior to pectinate line, I have told you it is endodermal in origin. It is supplied by autonomic nerves. Autonomic innervation includes both sympathetic coming from the inferior hypogastric plexus and parasympathetic by the pelvic splanchnic nerves S2, S3, S4. As I have already mentioned, sympathetic fibers will maintain the tone of the internal anal sphincter and parasympathetic fibers will inhibit the tone of internal sphincter and hence evoke peristaltic contraction for defecation. All visceral afferents will travel through parasympathetic fibers to spinal sensory ganglia of S2 to S4. Please remember anal canal is sensitive only to stretching. Below pectinate line it is somatic innervation. It is by the inferior rectal nerves which are branches of pudental nerve. Inferior to pectinate line hence is sensitive to pain touch temperature that does not hold good for area superior to pectinate line which has got autonomic innervation which is not sensitive to pain. Inferior to pectinate line somatic efferent fibers stimulate contraction of voluntary external anal sphincter. Having read about the detailed gross anatomy of anal canal we will go into the clinical anatomy of anal canal or the applied anatomy of anal canal which I will be describing under the following headings. The clinical importance of pectinate line, fissure in ano, fistula in ano and also hemorrhoids, internal and external hemorrhoids which is commonly described as spiles and also anal canal the site of portocaval anastomosis. 
first we will take up the clinical importance of pectinate line. As I have already mentioned, anal canal superior to pectinate line differs from part inferior to pectinate line in its arterial supply, venous drainage, lymphatic drainage and innervation which we have studied in detail. This is because of different embryological origins of superior and inferior parts of the anal canal. It is an important anatomical landmark as it is visible and is a region of transition from visceral to parietal area. It is an anatomical and embryological landmark. It is visible and is a region of transition from visceral area to parietal area. First we will take up fissure in ano. What is an anal fissure? It is a slit like lesion. You can see the interior of the anal canal. There is a slit like lesion here which is located in the posterior midline inferior to anal valves. Usually it occurs inferior to anal valves. Whom does it occur? It occurs in people who are chronically constipated, chronically constipated persons who strain during passing phases, what happens is the anal valves and mucosa are torn by the hard feces. The anal valves and mucosa are torn by the hard feces. So, the valves are lined by mucosa above and by the skin below. So, please understand that it is painful because of involvement of the skin because it is supplied by sensory fibers of inferior rectal nerves. Fissure in ano can lead to perianal abscess which may follow infection of the fissure and it will spread into the ischioanal fossa. As I have already mentioned on either side you have the ischioanal fossa and its contents. So, there is a formation of ischioanal abscess as you can see from this picture. Next is fistula in ano. What is a fistula? Fistula is a hollow tract lined with granulation tissue which connects a primary opening inside the anal canal with a secondary opening in the perianal skin. It is a hollow tract which can connect two cavities or it can connect one cavity to the exterior. There can be secondary tracts which may be multiple from the same primary opening. So, why does a fistula occur? Fistula occurs because of spread of anal infection, because of an abscess in the anal glands. Anal glands open into the anal sinus and there is going to be inflammation of the anal sinus, infection occurs. So, the anorectal abscess tends to track in various directions. One is it can open medially into the anal sinus. Second thing is it can open into the ischioanal fossa or it can open into the surface. It can open into the anal sinus, the fistulous tract. It can open into the ischioanal, abs, ischioanal fossa or it can open into the surface. So, one end of the fistula opens into anal canal other end opens into the abscess in the ischioanal fossa and one end can open into the into the perianal skin it is a tract. Coming to the clinical condition hemorrhoids which is commonly referred to as piles internal hemorrhoids or piles they are nothing but prolapse of the anal cushions which are saccular dilatations of internal rectal venous plexus. As I have already told you, in the submucosa you have the internal rectal venous plexus. So, hemorrhoids, internal hemorrhoids are because of the saccular dilatations of the internal rectal venous plexus as you can see from this picture. They occur because there is going to be a breakdown of the muscularis mucosae. They bleed profusely once the patient strains during passing stool, 
they are going to bleed profusely during straining at stools. Sometimes what happens is they can prolapse outside through the anal canal and they can be compressed by the contracting sphincter. Suppose if it gets compressed by the sphincter, there will be impeding of blood flow, strangulation can occur, ulceration also can occur. But please remember internal hemorrhoids are not painful as uh, I have already mentioned it is above the pectinate line and it is supplied by visceral afferent fibers. So internal hemorrhoids or piles are not painful because of the origin from area above the pectinate line. So if you look at the position of the primary piles they occur in three positions. If you put a patient in lithotomy position to view the location of the piles, it is usually at 3 o'clock position, 7 o'clock position and 11 o'clock position. The main factors which are responsible for development of hemorrhoids include pregnancy, chronic constipation and constipated persons straining during stools and any condition that will increase the intra-abdominal pressure. These are the four predisposing factors for hemorrhoids. So as I have already mentioned, you can see the patient in lithotomy position, you can see the three position of the primary piles. They are formed because of enlargement of three main radicals of superior rectal vein. So 3, 7, 11 o'clock positions which are left lateral, right posterior and right anterior position as shown in this picture. Varicosities in any other positions other than 3, 7 and 11 o'clock positions are called as secondary piles. They are called as secondary piles. There is also one more condition called as external hemorrhoids. We have been talking about internal hemorrhoids. Now it is external hemorrhoids or thrombosis or clots in the veins of the external rectal venous plexus and they are covered by skin. External hemorrhoids lie below the pectinate line. They lie below the pectinate line and are painful because they lie below the pectinate line and are supplied by the somatic sensory nerves that is the inferior rectal nerve. As I have already mentioned, anal canal is an important site of portocable anastomosis. We have already seen superior rectal vein, middle rectal vein and inferior rectal vein anastomose in the anal canal. This is a site of portocable anastomosis. This is because the superior rectal vein drains into inferior mesenteric vein that is the portal system. The middle and inferior rectal vein they drain into iliac veins finally into IVC that is the cable system. So it is the site of anal canal is a site of portocable anastomosis superior rectal vein anastomosing with the middle and inferior rectal veins. What happens is in portal hypertension because of cirrhosis of liver there is going to be enlargement of the superior rectal vein resulting in stasis of the internal rectal venous plexus and these plexus hemorrhoidal plexus become varicose or dilated in case of portal hypertension. So anal canal is an important site of portocaval anastomosis. So now we have come to the end of the lecture. We will discuss the clinical case study. I have already told you about the case study that the patient was a 50 year old man who had frequently passed blood stain stools for past one year without any pain. Recently he had noticed that his bowel protruded out of the anus at the time of defecation and this caused discomfort. The doctor examined the patient and came to a diagnosis. So we will discuss the questions. The clinical condition which bleeds during defecation is internal hemorrhoids or piles. The patient is having internal hemorrhoids or piles. So the anatomical basis of this condition is that 
the piles occur due to prolapse, prolapse of the anal cushions which are saccular dilatations of the internal rectal venous plexus which you have studied in detail. The, this is because of a breakdown of muscularis mucosa. The patient bleeds profusely during straining at stools. It is a clinical case we have seen and the internal hemorrhoids usually prolapse into or through the anal canal. The patient had this presentation also. I had asked a question why is the bleeding not painful as you have understood the gross anatomy of anal canal internal hemorrhoids lie above the pectinate line and this part of the mucous membrane is supplied by autonomic nerves and hence the patient does not have pain. Painless bleeding which occurs with prolapse of the internal rectal venous plexus is internal hemorrhoids or piles is the clinical uh, condition of the patient. Now we will summarize what we have learnt in this lecture. Anal canal is the terminal part of large intestine and of the entire digestive tract. Anal orifice or anus is the external outlet. The closure of the anal canal which leads to fecal continence is because of the coordinated action of involuntary internal sphincter and voluntary external anal sphincters. The sympathetically stimulated tonus of internal sphincter maintains closure except during parasympathetically stimulated peristaltic contraction of rectum. Internally, we have learned that the yellow line is a pectinate line is an important landmark which demarcates the superior part of the anal canal from the inferior part of the anal canal which have different embryological origin, arterial or arterial supply, venous drainage, lymphatic drainage and innervation. So, this is a transition from visceral area to a somatic area. Thrombosis of the external plexus, external hemorrhoids is painful. Mucosal prolapse including portions of internal rectal venous plexus causes pain insensitive internal hemorrhoids or piles which is a clinical case which, have, which we have discussed in detail.